Hey everyone, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We're so glad that you all are here today um, to join us for this webinar about the latest updates on the Medicaid block grant proposal and Medicaid expansion efforts here in Tennessee. My name is Kyla Franks. I'm the Director of Medicaid Policy Advocacy at the Tennessee Justice Center. And presenting with me today is Gordon Bonnyman, a staff attorney and co-founder of TJC. Um, we're excited to talk to you all more today on this webinar. Um, we know we've gotten a lot of questions already about a lot of these exciting and, and you know, interesting and new developments. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please just enter them into the Q&A box. We'll have a time for questions at the end, so we'll get to answer your questions at the end. Um, if we don't get to any of the questions, we'll make sure to send out responses afterwards. I just wanted you to know that you can type your questions into that Q&A box at any point. Also, we are recording the webinar, so if you miss something, you want to watch again, you know someone else who wants to watch it, um, we will be recording it, and so we'll be sending out the slides and the recording after the webinar. So, it'll, make, it'll make for hours of wholesome family entertainment. <laughs> that's what we go for, hours of wholesome family entertainment. So for the agenda for today, um, what we're going to be talking about specifically is the CMS guidance on Medicaid block grants, um, what that means for Tennessee and, and what we are looking at going forward. Um, we're also going to give a short update about Tennessee's work reporting requirements proposal. There's a, some recent news about that that we just wanted to highlight to make sure you all knew because we knew that you guys stood up to uh, oppose that proposal last year and the year before. So we wanted to give an update about that. And then we want to talk, uh, majority of this presentation will be about the Medicaid expansion bill that was filed by Representative Travis and Senator Briggs. So we want to talk about the prospects for that, the exciting new developments around that, what that means, how it came about, and um, we'd love to hear from you guys as well. So um, again, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So if you have questions throughout, please just submit them in the Q&A box. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Gordon. Thanks, Kyla. Um, on January 30th, there was a big um, national uh, news development in that um, Seema Verma, who's the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, had a big press event along with Secretary of Health and Human Services, Azar, to issue guidance to states, basically encouraging them to submit block grant proposals. Of course, Tennessee had already submitted a waiver proposal, and um, so far we're the only state that has done so, although Oklahoma's governor was there at the press event on the 30th making warm noises about it, but hasn't submitted anything yet. So we're at this point the only state that submitted something, and we were uh, anxiously awaiting the guidance, which had been, has been rumored to be coming out imminently for months now. Um, because we wanted to see whether the tenure proposal would fit with what CMS was saying it would approve. Um, keep in mind that a block grant is illegal under federal law, and uh, so the fact that CMS would approve something doesn't make it legal. On the other hand, if CMS, if even CMS, if even the Trump administration is saying, here are the parameters, and if you're outside of those, we won't approve it, then that's pretty significant because it, we start from the proposition it's illegal and if even the Trump people won't approve it, then that probably means that it's not going anywhere. Um, as expected, uh, the block grant guidance um, from CMS had uh, a lot of provisions that say basically uh, we will cap the amount of money that we give you if you apply for one of these waivers, it will no longer float upwards um, on a matching basis to keep pace with inflation, but um, in return for um, us being allowed to cap, you, you, you states allowing us to cap the federal payments, we're going to give you a lot of latitude and an incentive to cut the program. So. Um, of course, the, um, you, one would immediately ask, what state would want to do that? And the only states that would are those that are just fine with cutting Medicaid. And 
no state in, in history literally has cut Medicaid as much as Tennessee has. Uh, the cuts of 15 years ago have no equivalent before or since. Um, and the culture of the state is one in which, in political culture, in, in, in which generally our lawmakers uh, are, are eager to cut the program. So uh, that's the backdrop. Um, and when we saw the guidance, we saw that it uh, was inviting uh, block grant proposals that would allow charging premiums, um, raising co-payments, which are now strictly limited, um, be able to limit uh, prescription drugs, impose work requirements. If those things sound familiar, um, that's because we've, of course, already seen them in the state proposal. And um, that's one reason why national groups have come out against it um, and continue to oppose block grants. So the question is, what's the difference between what we propose and what the guidance says CMS will approve? And uh, basically, the, the CMS guidance says it, it's called the Healthy Adults Initiative. And um, it, the press release and a lot of the speechifying made it sound as if it was really only for expansion states for the childless adults that have no disabilities, are not pregnant, and are um, above in, in that band between 100% and 138% of poverty. Uh, but if you actually looked at the details and you parsed it out, um, and by the way, Seema Verma, the CMS administrator said in comments, she was asked at the press conference, what about Tennessee? And she said, well, that's different. It's separate, uh, but we're working with the state um, and we look forward to doing great things together, something, that, something to that effect. I think the bottom line for those of us in Tennessee who are concerned about this is that although we don't exactly fit the group that they talked about at the press conference, uh, because we don't cover that group because we have not expanded Medicaid, um, CMS guidance, when you read the fine print, would enable the state to block grant the funding for caretaker relatives, uh, or at least some caretaker relatives of minor children, which is a group of several hundred thousand people. These are the same people that the state um, has tried to impose work requirements on, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, of course, what that ignores is all the literature, all the research that shows that children do better when their parents do better. So cutting the parents off of Medicaid or restricting their access to prescription drugs or otherwise limiting their ability to stay healthy is not a good thing for the kids. But the political optics of this is we're just, we're just going after healthy adults who uh, the implication is are deadbeats and not doing anything, even though, of course, the great majority of these folks are uh, actually employed or are taking care of very small children. So um, just a couple of technical asides about the pending state block grant. First, again, as with all block grants, it's not legal. Second, uh, if you look at it compared to um, the guidance, it appears that it, it will have to be changed enough through negotiations that uh, if it's approved without restarting and going through a new notice and approval and public comment process, that in itself could be an additional grounds for legal challenge. So the, the differences between the guidance and what we proposed, and therefore the likely changes that will be made to what we proposed, suggest that they should start all over again. The other thing is that, without boring you with the details, some of our caretaker relatives are protected even by the CMS guidance. And these are people who would meet 
the eligibility rules for the old Aid to Families with Dependent Children program that went out of existence in 1996. So the state would have to resurrect the eligibility process for determining whether, apart from their current Medicaid eligibility, they, they would meet those old AFDC rules. So they have to do a separate eligibility process to figure out who's exempt and who's not. Having dealt with AFDC 30 years ago, I can tell you that's a complex process. So if the state were being rational and not seeing all of this through an ideological or political lens, it would just shrug and say, it's not worth trying to uh, pick the fly specs from the pepper shaker. We can't sort these people out, forget it, drop the block grant. But of course, we know that that's not necessarily the way things are operating. So um, the bottom line of all this is the block grant proposal that Tennessee has submitted is still alive. It's still a threat. Um, and you will recall that the state law that directed TenCare to submit the proposal to CMS provided after folks on this call and a lot of others raised sand during the legislative session to get it through, it was amended to say that any proposal would have to come back to the legislature for approval. So we need to keep the pressure on the legislature and on the administration of Governor Lee to say, this is a bad idea. It's not focusing on the real problems of Tennesseans and it should not go forward. And if it does come back to the state, it shouldn't be approved. So far, Governor Lee has been totally undaunted. He said he'll, he's willing to call a special session, perhaps, um, as soon as they get uh, approval. We think that for political reasons, this may well get approved. Some renegotiated version may get approved before the election so that President Trump can tick the box that says, I promise block grants, I've delivered a block grant, even if it's only one foolish state, Tennessee. So it's likely that it'll, it'll be approved at some point in the next um, seven or eight months. And um, we want to make sure that the legislature is feeling trepidations about approving it when it comes back. So that's the update on the block grants. Just another minute on work requirements, another really bad idea. Um, you'll recall that in 2018, the legislature uh, adopted work requirements, but we raised uh, a lot of objections about that with your help. And uh, the fiscal note showed that it would cost $34 million annually. That would have killed it, but then Speaker, um, the, the then House Speaker came up with this gimmick of saying, we'll use unexpended TANF monies. And you've probably been reading the headlines of the past couple of months that about the scandal of Tennessee having accrued uh, three quarters of a billion dollars in unspent money that's intended for the very poorest children in the state. Um, and it's just sitting there unspent. And so, uh, the idea was we'll use that money uh, to impose work requirements. There are legal problems with that, which we've raised and continue to raise, uh, but that was the way they got around the $34 million uh, fiscal note, which would have kept it from passing because that would have been too costly. So um, what we just read within the past few weeks was an Associated Press article that indicated that there's been emails uh, between the state and not CMS, but another branch of HHS, Department of Health and Human Services, that administers the TANF program, uh, pestering the federal uh, officials to approve the use of the TANF money to implement Tennessee's Medicaid work requirements. That's still pending um, and um, what I think this news item tells us is just that although we had hoped that the state uh, might have been willing to let the cat die on work reporting requirements, they aren't. They're still aggressively pursuing it, and it's this TANF issue that's holding it up. Um, it's ironic that the state is 
so aggressive about using the TANF money for that since it's been so absolutely derelict and irresponsible about using the TANF money for its intended purpose, which is, again, to help the very poorest, uh, most disadvantaged, most at-risk children in the state. So we don't know when that's likely to shake loose. We suspect there will be Trump administration political intervention to, um, to, to make that, to clear the tracks for that to happen. If it is approved, it doesn't come back to the legislature. It will go to court at that point, um, and it's not likely to be implemented um, before the end of the year. So just want to bring you up to date on that, that it's unfortunate the state is still not uh, really engaging. But that brings us to the conversation that we really want to have, which is um, the conversation that's been sidetracked by these uh, shiny objects by the distractions of um, the block grant, which we know is a bad idea, work requirements, um, which is just a way of uh, trying to propagate um, myths and stereotypes of Medicaid parents as, as irresponsible and lazy. So um, it's been a way of changing the subject away from Insure Tennessee, Governor Haslam's bill from five years ago that was shot down by the legislature and that with your help we've kept uh, on the agenda long, low these many years. Um, and so we really want to um, thank Representative Ron Travis for filing a bill, who's a Republican, for filing a bill to um, resurrect Insure Tennessee and get it approved. And although you see us referring on these slides and in some of the email to Medicaid expansion um, so that everybody knows what we're talking about. It's significant that Representative Travis is talking about Insure Tennessee and we want to use the language Insure Tennessee. That was Republican Governor Haslam's terminology. It's separate from Medicaid expansion. It's a, a Republican waiver that uses the expansion funds but has some additional um, features to it that would not be there in regular Medicaid expansion. So um, I think to distinguish this from uh, Medicaid expansion, which Democrats have proposed forever and, and is therefore somewhat radioactive to Republicans, uh, I think it's no accident that Representative Travis has talked about in Sure Tennessee, and we should too in our external communications. Um, if you read the, the news stories about it, uh, you know about the poignant backstory, which is that the representative's sister-in-law had a treatable illness, which um, she delayed getting care for because she was uninsured, because she was in the insurance gap. And um, by the time she got care, it was too late, and she passed away uh, a few months ago. And that has galvanized him, um, and he's responded by filing this bill. The response of legislative leaders in the Beacon Center was to say, uh, nothing to see here, folks, move along. Um, I think it's significant that they were so anxious to say that. Um, but I think there's no reason for us to think that they have some special insight that the rest of us don't about what's going to happen here, because the fact of the matter is, this is unprecedented. Um, this whole debate has gone on for six years now, uh, for one year before Insure Tennessee was introduced, about whether to use the federal money to cover people who are in the insurance gap, and it's been somewhat abstract. Our stories of our clients, of people on this call, of uh, working men and women who can't get access to cover, we put those stories out there. But they have, they have, none of them has struck as close to home as what happened to the Travis family. And he is part of a small group of Tennesseans who happen to belong to the General Assembly. He's one of them. And um, if you ever attend their sessions, there are always resolutions at the beginning of the session about, you know, expressing prayers and thoughts for Representative so-and-so or Senator so-and-so whose, you know, third cousin, fifth removed is 
have a, having a tonsillectomy. Um, it's kind of a club. People know each other, even on a bipartisan base, there, basis. There's still, uh, despite the, the partisanship, there's still personal interactions that count for something. Um, Representative Travis, for his part, is absolutely authentic about this. Uh, he's not doing this for any reason other than that he's passionate about it. And when advocates met with him the other day, one of them commented that sadly there are hundreds of instances like this, and he interrupted and said not hundreds but thousands. Um, the term that was used to describe him at, was on fire. So um, that is remarkable. Um, we, of course, know that we're in a shrinking minority of states, uh, including Republican states, that uh, continue to turn this down. You'll notice on this slide here, the blue state, Nebraska, uh, is one that where they had a referendum and approved it by referendum, and their legislature is still dragging their feet about it. Um, but uh, they had a referendum in Utah, which they won, and they had a referendum in, was it Idaho? Idaho. Uh, so wherever, and those are deep red states, at least as Republican as ours, whenever uh, people are allowed to express a view on this, uh, they vote for it uh, in Republican states. That's a lesson that's not lost on our lawmakers. And so um, we know that it's a matter of time we will ultimately win, but how soon we win is critically important because every day that goes by, there's more needless suffering. So our supposition here is that um, the leadership, specifically uh, Cameron Sexton, the new House Speaker, who chaired Three Star Task Force uh, in 2016, that proposed a phased expansion of Medicaid, that he gets it, that he understands that this is the right thing to do, um, but uh, he needs to be persuaded that it's also the politic thing to do. Uh, just a reminder, a quick refresher on Insure Tennessee or a, or a primer for those who weren't around uh, when it was being debated um, five years ago, is there, there was a um, University of Tennessee Center for Business and Economic Research, which um, put out a report showing that um, it would, the proposal would cover up to 300,000 people and generate um, lots and lots of jobs across the economy. Um, unfortunately, as we know, that was rejected by the legislature, and in fact, we're going in the wrong direction with the rate of uninsured people going up, including uninsured children. Uh, most recently, 46,000 more Tennesseans uh, without health insurance. And I think that's consistent with the storyline we need to keep using with public and with lawmakers and with the governor, which is we're going in the wrong direction. The trend lines in Tennessee, in contrast to other states that are using the federal money, um, it, we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, just yesterday, we saw the release of a new study which showed that Tennessee, again, is leading the country in the rate of rural hospital closings. Only Texas, which of course is several times bigger than us, has more absolute number of hospitals, but if you adjust for population, we far outstrip Texas or any other state in the loss of rural hospitals. And this new study looked at hospitals that are currently open and found that over half of Tennessee's currently operating rural hospitals, their financial profile is that of the hospitals that have closed over the past decade. In other words, they look very much like uh, they're going to go the same way as the hospitals that have closed, over half of rural hospitals, which is horrifying in terms of what that means, um, not just for rural health infrastructure and access, but for um, the economic viability of, of affected communities. Uh, we've just been seeing within the past week the saga of Big South Fork Medical Center in Oneida, which is closed and reopened. Uh, and now it's diverting patients because it's missed payroll. Um, it just shows how difficult 
it is to re reopen a hospital once it closes. Um, and uh, Cumberland River Hospital uh, in Talana is another example uh, where new people bought it, but they haven't been able to open it. So you don't want to lose your hospital. If you do, you may never get one back. Um, just a quick recap of what the UT um, Center for Business and Economic Research uh, study and the legislature's fiscal review committee have noted, which is it's about $1.4 billion annually that the uh, Insure Tennessee would bring into the state in terms of funding, and um, it would generate about 15,000 jobs across the economy, not just in the health system. And it would provide support for services like prevention and treatment of addiction um, uh, to deal with the increased uh, loss of life among new mothers um, and to deal with other uh, really serious health problems like obesity and diabetes. So I'm going to turn it over to Colin to talk about, well, where's Governor Lee in all this? So we saw last Monday, February 3rd, Governor Lee delivered his second State of the State address. Um, and there's a couple of things that we wanted to note and point out about where he's at and you know, what, our, what our roles are as advocates going forward. Um, so did just want to highlight uh, something that he mentioned in his state of the state that is also a bill that is uh, in the legislature right now to extend postpartum coverage for moms on 10 care um, up to 12 months. And that came as a result of news coverage late last year about, I think it was 52 deaths of mothers um, who lost their lives after they lost their 10 care, um, but within the first year of their child being born. Um, we were, you know, grateful that our state leaders recognized the shock of the fact that their decisions have life and death consequences and, and hope that that, you know, recognition now, uh, especially with Representative Travis's bill, is extending to show the devastating consequences of the failure to pass a plan like Insure Tennessee. Um, we also know that in order to truly address the maternal health crisis, there is more that we should do. Um, research has shown that Medicaid expansion increases access to preventative care, reduces adverse health outcomes before, during, and after pregnancies, and reduces maternal mortality rates. So we know that in, if we're caring about mothers, um, especially after you know, they have their children during that, that, that first year, um, there's more that we should do in order to make sure they have what they need. And also, Tennessee is only one of three states that uh, does not have uh, any type of preconception care for mothers. So before they get pregnant, um, they have access to uh, services that would be helpful in family planning services. Um, so we're one of only three states that don't offer any type of maternal uh, coverage for uh, preconception care. Um, whether that is Medicaid expansion or a family planning waiver. So Tennessee is really in the minority here, and we need to do more to make sure that moms can, uh, you know, be healthy. Also wanted to note that last year in the state of the state, Governor Lee said health care is one of his top three priorities, and that every Tennessean should have access to high-quality health care they can afford. A lot of people on this phone were animated by that and excited to hear that he is those are great words, and we agree that every Tennessee should have access to high-quality health care they can afford. But now we need to hold him to this commitment. A year later, um, we had listening sessions for his health care modernization task force, and the task force was formed late in the year. I think it only met maybe once, and the governor is saying they expect results maybe next year. Um, but meanwhile, as we know, there are life and death consequences of a failure to act. And so we need to hold the governor to this commitment. Um, he, he knows health care is important. It's important politically for him. And we need to make sure that he is taking uh, action to stand behind that commitment and to really push forward policy priorities that actually take concrete action and not just in some distant future, but right now. And then speaking of other uh, key leaders, you know, as we go forward as advocates who we need to be talking to and contacting and, and moving forward, especially now with the bill filed by Representative Travis, um, I'm sure all, a lot of people on this call are aware that, you know, Speaker Cameron Sexton is key in the debates about Medicaid expansion, 
as Gordon mentioned earlier on the webinar, he chaired the Three Star Healthy Task Force in 2016. Due to the amazing pressure of a lot of advocates, I'm sure on this call and people who've been advocating for years on Speaker Harwell, the former Speaker of the House, um, she was motivated to call this Three Star Healthy Task Force forward. Um, and so that pressure led then to the task force and then the task force came up with a Medicaid expansion plan, a two-phase Medicaid expansion plan that likely would have passed in the 2017 legislative session. Um, they came out with the proposal in, uh, and released it to the public through a press conference in mid-2016. Um, and so it seemed on track and ready to go forward, but then the 2016 election threw that off as our state legislators said that, uh, well, we're waiting on Washington to see what happens before we move forward with this proposal. So Cameron Sexton chaired that healthy task force. Um, he gets, you know, a lot of these, these debates, and so he's a key player in a lot of this. Anything else you wanted to say about no, I think he's he's a banker. He gets the finances of it. Um, I I think that he's probably you know there's the famous story about uh, President Johnson saying to civil rights leaders, "I agree with you now, make me do it." Um, in other words, I I need for you to create the financial pressure that will give me cover to do it. So I think that um, unlike some lawmakers who probably just don't understand. Um, the practicalities, I think Speaker Sexton does, and I think our task is to create the political climate so that he can act on what he knows to be the right thing. So that just leads to our first action item that everyone can do and please ask others to do. We think that it's really important to take two minutes to call Speaker Sexton and just ask him to support Representative Travis's Ensure Tennessee bill. Um, we want to make sure that he's hearing from us to, to give him cover to do it, to make sure that people know this hasn't gone away. It's not that, you know, the people in purple t-shirts have, have disappeared into the sidelines and they're not a worry anymore. We need to show that we are still around. We care. We still care. We're still showing up. We're still calling and we're not going to give up until this is over the finish line. And I know I'm preaching to the choir to a lot of people on this call who, who've been standing here for years. Um, and so we're grateful to be able to stand with you and to keep up this really vitally important fight. So please reach out to Speaker Sexton. It really doesn't take very long to call. Um, we just think that they need to be, you know, our legislature needs to be flooded with calls. Um, and speaking of, of course, call your own legislators too. Just put that in there. You know, your own legislators um, are, are important. But especially if you live in the districts of representatives who serve on the 10 care subcommittee, and I put that list below, please ask them to support this bill. Um, and, you know, we said, I said the Medicaid expansion bill on this slide, really call it the Insure Tennessee bill, uh, Representative Travis's Insure Tennessee bill. Um, we know this will come up in this subcommittee. It'll be one of the first, you know, tests. We really want to make sure that it passes in this subcommittee. So if you live in these districts, please call these people, tell them to support this, this bill. Um, it's really important. If you don't know uh, the district that you live in and whether one of these people, these representatives, is your representative, um, there's a really handy tool on the Tennessee General Assembly website where you can enter your address and city and it'll tell you uh, your representative and senator at the state level. So if you just Google Tennessee General Assembly, find my legislator, then you'll be able to find quickly whether one of these people is yours. And I can send that out in the follow-up email as well. So in case you don't know whether one of these people is your representative, we encourage you to look that up. If I, if I may just add something here, I think in calls to Speaker Sexton and to uh, all lawmakers, I think the tone should be, um, of course, it's always, we're always supposed to be respectful, need to be respectful, but I would say that it should be somber and um, asking, not demanding, um, and framing it in terms of um, Representative Travis's personal loss and the loss of other people like that. Uh, what can they do to, to support him and prevent this from happening to other people? Um, I think that is the greatest point of vulnerability for the opponents, which is 
here's this poignant, um, heartbreaking story of, of a loss of one of their own, and that's where the messaging needs to be. And again, in a very um, respectful and somber sort of way, not, a, not an angry or demanding way. So we left a lot of time for questions. We know that we've been getting a lot of questions from folks. We do want to open it up now to questions so that we can make sure to, to answer anything that you guys are wondering about any of the topics that we've discussed, the CMS guidance on Medicaid block grants, the updates on uh, the Medicaid work reporting requirements, and the uh, new updates around Medicaid expansion. So if you have any questions at this point, you'll see a Q&A box. Um, please just type your questions in there and we'll be able to, to see them and to be able to answer them. Again, if we're not getting to you, it's because we're answering a lot of questions and we'll make sure to, to follow up. So. so we have a first question that is, since the administration has submitted the request for a waiver, doesn't that mean that legislators demand that the waiver be applied for without having to keep it going as a, if it's turned down? And, and the answer to that is, Yes, it does mean that. Uh, and in fact, Governor Lee, when he was under pressure um, to to not go forward, said, "Well, if it's if we can't work out a good deal, then I won't implement it." So um, they could walk away from it this afternoon if they wanted to, and they would have satisfied the requirement of the legislation. Um, and lawmakers understand that. The administration was supposed to ask for it, but that doesn't mean that they have to accept whatever terms CMS agrees to. Uh, this is really a matter of political will, and that's one reason why the enormous showing of, of opposition during the comment period and at the public hearings was so important to convey to lawmakers this is not a popular initiative that they've launched, and they should not be aggressive about pushing it. Um, we need to continue to express our dissatisfaction with the block grant to the governor and to lawmakers. But I think the main thing at this point, given this dramatic development with Representative Travis's bill, is that it, we want to pivot back to our conversation. Our conversation is we have all of these unmet needs we need to take advantage of the federal funding that is out there that we're now shipping to Washington for distribution to other states. We need it here, and we need it to prevent the kind of tragedy that befell the Travis family. And, um, you know, that's what we ought to be talking about rather than the block grant. I think if we keep enough pressure on them around that, um, we're not going to we don't expect an action on the block grant at the federal level for months. And so right now I say the conversation really should be focused on do something meaningful and Representative Travis's bill is something meaningful. Great. Thanks, Gordon. Our next question is about uh, how is the required financial training for rural hospitals going even early in your health system, which is huge, is having severe financial issues. Um, there's a lot of diversity within the hospital industry. There are big hospital systems that are actually doing quite well. Uh, but then, as you say, Erlanger in Chattanooga um, is having problems. Um, so it, there's a lot of variability. The co one common denominator is um, the majority of rural hospitals are, as the, the study released yesterday shows, the majority are are in imminent danger of closing. So um, what, the, what the question refers to is a bill that was passed by the legislature to hire consultants to go around to rural hospitals and advise them on how uh, to do a better job of financial management, um, which is sort of like going to a, a slum in Mumbai and uh, to the poor children who are scrambling through the, through the uh, the gutter looking for scraps of food and saying they really need to uh, be more efficient at what they're doing and they need uh, to have a better diet. The problem for rural hospitals is not financial management, it's lack of revenues. And um, the study that was just released yesterday looked at um, the discrepancy between expansion states and non-expansion states and confirmed what earlier studies have found, which is that um, states that have, that have not
taking advantage of the federal money and allowed those revenues to flow to the rural hospitals are much more likely to have rural hospitals close. So I think the idea of telling legislature telling uh, hospitals in struggling communities, we're going to send you consultants when what they really need is the Medicaid funding is either cynical or misinformed, but um, it, it's not going to have any effect. Um, now, in terms of how is that going, I suspect the consultants have gone around and been very polite and had the meetings and so forth and so on. But as we can see from as recently as last week with the problems at Oneida, um, it's really not going to have any effect on the ground. And that's why our message continues to be the state needs to get real. It needs to attend to real solutions uh, to these problems and, and, and not come up with gimmicks like consultants uh, or some of these other even more damaging things like work requirements. Great. Thanks, Gordon. The next question is about, um, at a recent press conference announcing a draconian anti-abortion bill, Governor Lee said they're concerned about the well-being of Tennessee children. Can you be challenged on these remarks to make Medicaid more available to children? I think that's a great point. I think it's, it's sort of the point that Kyla was making earlier about Governor Lee saying that, uh, you know, every Tennessean should have access to affordable health care. Um, and I think we just need to, one may be tempted in some cases to be cynical about that, but I think the better course both practically uh, and politically as, as well as in, in some deeper personal level is, is just to take it at face value and hold people to account to live up to that. I'm so grateful that you're concerned about the well-being of Tennessee children. What are you doing, Governor, about the fact that we um, are one of the top two or three states in terms of children losing coverage, uh, most of whom have been cut from TennCare or the Cover Kids program without a finding that they were actually ineligible, but because of paperwork issues? Um, I think we just need to be starting with the expressions of concern and pivoting uh, to, the, to the real issues. That's a really great point. Thank you for raising that. Um, our next question is, can you expand on the difference between Insure Tennessee and Medicaid expansion? Uh, yes. Um, Insure Tennessee was frankly a way that Governor Haslam, former governor, uh, who understood, although he didn't, obviously didn't foresee that the, that the backlash would be as strong as it turned out to be, he foresaw resistance to Medicaid expansion because it was being pilloried as Obamacare and a democratic initiative and therefore uh, right-wing groups like the Beacon Center, Americans for Prosperity were uh, basically putting Republican lawmakers in a position where they were going to be accused of being for Obamacare if they supported Medicaid expansion. So. He said, I'm not going to do Medicaid expansion. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to take the funding that was intended to expand coverage, and I'm going to seek a waiver from the federal government that will enable us to cover the same people with federal money, um, with the hospitals paying the 10% of the cost that, that would be the state's responsibility. So it wouldn't cost the taxpayers anything. He said, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to add some bells and whistles to distinguish it from a straightforward Medicaid expansion. So he had some talk in there about work requirements, although at the time there, uh, under the Obama administration, it was, he knew and everybody else knew those would never be approved. Um, there was talk about Medicaid, medical savings accounts and buying individuals into, if they were working into their employer's insurance plans. Um, Upon further examination, I think the conclusion was that employers would never stand for that, and it, it probably would just go away quietly. Um, so there are some things like that to basically say this is not Medicaid expansion. This is something Republican, Tennessee, different, unique, but it's not that terrible Obamacare. So that's the difference, and that's one reason why, although the slides refer to Medicaid expansion, so everybody knows what we're talking about, 
I think after this call, please remove that, do a search and delete for the term Medicaid expansion in your in your personal memory bank and vocabulary and replace it with Insure Tennessee going forward. It's about packaging. Um, Tony Gar has comment, I would like to see our request for Insure Tennessee be separated from block grants and work requirements. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, Representative Travis's uh, bill does uh, talk about the Insure Tennessee being being implemented in the context of a block grant or revising the block grant to include work requirements as well as Insure Tennessee. Um, and I, I agree, we don't want to see Insure Tennessee being part of a block grant. For one thing, apart from um, some of the draconian provisions that would likely be included that would make it make the health coverage worth less, such as um, uh, inadequate drug be benefit. Um, if the money is capped, then healthcare inflation, which for 60 or 70 years has regularly outstripped the rate of growth of state revenues, will overtake the program and it will erode over time. So um, we definitely want those things to be separate. I think at this point, we just want to say, go forward with Insure Tennessee, and meanwhile, we need to, if we can get some um, a momentum going behind Representative Travis, find other Republican co-sponsors that will come on and grow that posse, um, that's what we need to do right now. And then, um, once it's got some momentum, have the conversations we need to have about why um, muddling it up with a block grant or work requirements is a bad idea. But I think you're absolutely right. The way the bill is written right now is unfortunate, um, but I think the main thing is it's starting the conversation afresh, um, supported by a backstory that is, is really unprecedented in the country. Um, our national colleagues have reached out to us. They're unaware of, of anything like this happening in another state that hadn't already expanded Medicaid where, where a, a lawmaker or political leader actually suffered a personal tragedy because of a family member that was in the gap. So we, we, we want to build on this um, and try to redeem this tragic loss um, as, as quickly as we can. And thanks, Tony, for the other update that Travis's bill has been assigned to the 10 Care Subcommittee, and the goal is to get this bill, Travis's goal is to get this bill to the Assurance Committee. That's helpful and, and good for everyone to know, so thank you for that. Um, so that sort of led well into the next question, which is, what is the connection between uh, the administration's, the state's block grant request and Insure Tennessee if both are accepted? Well, um, we don't know what the block grant would look like. Um, we know that it cannot be approved in its present form. So there would be a bunch of negotiations. We don't know when it comes out the end of that sausage making process what it will look like. Uh, we do know that if it's a block grant, it's illegal and we will challenge it. Um, I think our concern is that we don't want the Insure Tennessee proposal um, to be contingent upon being part of a block grant, uh, which would really insert a poison pill in Insure Tennessee uh, because it would all be in, in a context that, that is illegal. Um, we did have another question about CMS's guidance about Medicaid block grants. Um, what provisions in the Medicaid statute w would states be able to circumvent under a Medicaid block grant approved by CMS? Oh, it, a host of provisions. Um, they'd be able, for example, to change the the funding formula, and this is the most this is the clearest um, um, you want to respond. the the um, the clearest violation of the statute is that it prescribes what the funding formula is. And by creating this provision that says, 
oh, we're going to cap your funding. That changes the formula one way, but then it changes in another way by saying, and if you cut the program, you get to keep part of the savings. So uh, as an example, that's almost certainly illegal. Uh, I mean, when I say almost certainly, I mean, it is illegal and it would almost certainly be held illegal by courts. Um, the, for, the pharmacy provisions are also pretty clearly unlawful. Um, there's really the, the whole, almost all of the, there, there are a number of provisions in the block grant uh, guidance that actually are somewhat misleading in that, that they hold out this allure to the um, states to say, we'll give you this additional flexibility to do A, B, and C um, if you accept a, a block grant with the federal cap funding cap, when re the reality is that many of those things, A, B, and C, are already approvable. So um, there are, an, and have been approved for other states. So such as, to, to take an example close to home, the waiver of coverage for the period before the person applies. Under the law, uh, people who apply for Medicaid and are approved can get coverage for bills incurred up to 90 days before they apply. When TenCare started in 1994, that was waived, and it's been waived ever since. We're a minority, but part of the, the inducement for states to seek block grants was, well, we will waive retroactive coverage for you. Uh, of course, that's only going to be appealing to states that want to deny services and financial security to their residents, but there are states like that, including our own. So, But that's a good example of something where the guidance says, oh, we'll let you do this if you accept a cap, when the reality is they can do it anyway. Um, so um, the guidance is a mix of uh, flummery, of um, flim flam in terms of trying to mislead the states into reaching for the bait. Uh, but uh, behind the bait is the real hook, which is changing the financial arrangement, which is flatly illegal. All right, thank you, Gordon. Tony, we got your request to speak about the Travis bill and know that you've been in conversations with Representative Travis and I just figured out the tech to allow you to do this, I think. So see if you can say something now, Tony. Tony, can you hear us? Can you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Well, th thank you, Gordon, and thank you, Kyle. I, I just just a a couple of things that are more emphasis than anything else. Um, I put together a whole list of all the counties that the uh, folks on the 10 care uh, subcommittee are, are from, but that can best be done by you by going on the uh, Tennessee General Assembly website and uh, clicking on that state legis who your state legislators are to find out where your counties are. Uh, and it, it, it's going to be helpful to make sure that everybody on that 10 care subcommittee uh, does get uh, emails and calls and personal letters uh, from people in, who are their constituents. Um, we think that uh, state legislators in rural Tennessee are going to have a significant impact and so it's really important that if you are from rural Tennessee that you contact your state leg legislator. Uh, Gordon mentioned earlier about the importance of keeping block grants and work requirements. That's a separate issue. We don't want to even talk about that in our letters. We want to, like Gordon said and suggested, that we use Insure Tennessee, not expand Ten Care, and we sort of work at it, work at it that way. I think another thing just to keep in mind is um, yesterday the Ten Care Subcommittee announced that if any state legislator wants their bill to be taken up by the Ten Care Subcommittee, uh, they have to put it on notice, meaning to be heard by the 10 care subcommittee by March the 4th. So just want to raise the issue is that, you know, uh, things, if they, if it doesn't get through a committee or a subcommittee, there's no chance for it to get to the floor. So uh, we just, there's a lot of work to do in a short period of time. Um, 
just to emphasize a couple other things, um, we, we need to be very respectful. I think Gordon mentioned that, and I think that's just something that we really need to do and talk to our state legislators through email and voice, et cetera, in a very polite and uh, respectful way. As if you get a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with your state legislator, it's really important to try to figure out why they may be opposed to it or why they would be open to supporting it and sharing that information back with us. So uh, that's, that's important to do. Um, I'm gonna, I'll sort of thank you very much, uh, Tyler, for letting me uh, share a few extra thoughts with you. Bye. Thanks, Tony. And I, I just want to add one thing about your point about contacting the uh, members of the subcommittee. Um, we got a comment that one of the members is hopeless, and um, I, I, I understand that sentiment. Uh, but even if a particular lawmaker, if you're in their district and you know them to be hopeless, please contact them anyway and get others in the district to do that. Um, what we know is that even though you may not turn them into a yes vote, you may make them less vocal in opposition. Um, so they're, we don't want to write off anybody. We can't afford to do that. So um, even if you know that somebody is an ardent opponent, uh, they need to hear enough to make them think, well, maybe this is not something I want to stick my neck out on as far as I would if I thought it was just a, absolutely a, a winner for me. Um, and so we also have a question about someone who's going to Jackson, uh, who's in Jackson this evening is going to the governor's West Tennessee state of the state. Um, and what is the main thing to say to the governor? Um, bringing up the Travis family, et cetera, but what is the main thing? And, and thank you for that question. And thank you for, you know, bringing that up. Uh, Cause I think it's really powerful as well. The governor goes, you know, he did an East Tennessee state of the state last week and now is doing the West Tennessee state of the state. I would invoke with him, given his Christianity, I would invoke Matthew 25. Um, you know, I was sick and you cared for me. Um, I think we, you know, I think we need to call on his better angels. I would express appreciation for his promise that he was going to see to it that everyone had access to affordable care um, and that as Representative Travis's tragedy, illustrates uh, this really is a call on our conscience to do the right thing morally. And so in our final minutes, um, I'm going to answer three questions pretty quickly, but they're all amazing questions about calls to action and what we should do next. So one person expressed that they can't call legislators, but does it do any good to send an email? And yes, of course, you know, please contact your legislators however you are capable of doing so. Um, it is important they get these stories of, you know, real people, if you are able to share that in any of your communications. Um, but those, those communications from constituents and from people who care about this issue, sharing those personal stories is good in whatever format you're able to deliver. So we encourage calls, but if that's not possible for you, please send an email. Or, or a handwritten note. Handwritten notes tend to get a lot more attention just because they get so few of them. Um, or I'd say handwritten, it can be word processed, but I mean a, a snail mail, old fashioned hard copy letter uh, gets their attention the way email does not. And then we got another request that we distribute some of the bullet points about why Insure Tennessee was such a good plan. And yes, we would love to do that. Um, we have so much good talking points that we've already developed about this plan. So guess what? We get to reuse all that work. And, and all of you guys who've been doing this for so many years get to reuse that. But we'll make sure to send that out. Um, we'll make sure to be posting on social media as you suggest, which is a great idea as well. Um, and we will make sure to post it on our website. We'll, we'll be getting it out everywhere and would love your help with distributing the materials as well. Um, and then the final question is, do you recommend that those of us who do not live in committee members' districts contact them as well? And, and um, what I would say to that is we're working on uh, setting up uh, an arrangement where folks can call who are willing to make calls Frankly, if you're not in the district, you're not, unless you're calling the speaker who's got statewide ambitions and statewide responsibilities, you're, you're not likely to get much attention. But 
Um, if you're a constituent, you are, and we are working on an arrangement where volunteers can call into the district to constituents to educate those constituents and get them to make calls. So stay tuned. Um, we're we're going to be looking for volunteers to help with that. We know that makes a difference. Tony, who was speaking on the phone call a moment ago, a couple of years ago, um, set up an arrangement like that when Beth Harwell, the speaker, was playing a key role, and that that those calls into her district, getting her constituents to contact her, had a lot to do with her appointing three-star task force. So thank you for your willingness to make calls, even if you're not in a member dist in a in a committee member district. Um, we will enable you to to make a difference by calling people who are in the districts. And one more suggestion from Tony is if you're outside of Nashville and you can travel to Nashville to talk to your state legislator, um, legislators will ordinarily make time with you, so to talk with you. So call ahead to make an appointment, um, but that's another very impactful thing you can do to talk with your state legislature. Um, so just traveling in, call to make an appointment, those in-person meetings are powerful. The final action item, I love it, dust off our insured Tennessee t-shirts <laughs> and wear them everywhere. Thank you, Marilee. Thank you, Marilee. We love that. So we'll follow up with you guys soon um, with, um, with the recording, the slides, um, some more information about all these topics. Um, but we'd love to keep in conversation with all of you about this going forward. This is exciting and we're just really honored to be standing alongside all of you um, during the last couple of years and right now as, as a new bill is filed. So thank you all.